What you are seeing is atrial fibrillation, the most common form of irregular heartbeat, created by an overwhelming of the electrical impulses responsible for maintaining a steady heart rhythm. Atrial fibrillation, or AF for short, is a major risk factor for stroke, a clinical event when a blood vessel carrying nutrients to the brain is blocked by a clot, resulting in a rapid loss of brain function. Stroke causes the death or permanent disabling of 10 million people worldwide every year. The lifetime risk of AF is estimated to be approximately 25% for individuals 40 years of age or older. AF carries a four to five-fold increased risk of stroke. Clearly, this can be a serious condition. Yet statistics reveal that high numbers of AF patients are unaware of the link between AF and stroke. In this video, we will learn about the importance of managing stroke risk and how best to achieve this. We'll also examine where and when along the journey AF patients may inadvertently be lost from the best care pathway and the need for a clear, flexible long-term care plan to get them back on track. It tends to be a GP who will diagnose AF, but very soon after that they should be referred ideally to an AF specialist nurse who will look after the whole package of their care. After that it should be the cardiologist to receive appropriate treatment and in some cases patients will need to be referred on to an electrophysiologist. It's important along every step of the way that the patient is informed educated and then supported by the doctor, by the nurse, to come to the best decision that suits them. Evidently, managing AF-related stroke risk is not that simple, because many factors in a patient's daily life can vary their risk of stroke or bleeding. In patients with atrial fibrillation, the role of the family doctor is twofold. One, to identify those people who may have developed the arrhythmia by simply taking a pulse, and of course, in the ongoing management of continually assessing their, the nature of their symptoms and their stroke risk and how appropriate it would be to treat that, usually with an anticoagulant. It's important that they continually assess the patient's risk of stroke or if a patient is on anticoagulation, then also assessing their risk of bleeding and the risk of taking that therapy and reporting back to the responsible clinician. It's a huge opportunity when setting up a management plan for atrial fibrillation for patients who are newly diagnosed to get things right first time. If you get things right first time, you can really influence the whole patient pathway, the patient experience and the clinical outcomes. What you need to make sure though is that the two strands of the management plan are coordinated together. So you're managing the patient's symptoms of AF but you're also managing their stroke risk. And all too often at the moment, the two are separated and the stroke risk is treated as something completely different or not treated at all. Patients are hugely frightened of stroke. They're not frightened of dying from a stroke, but they're frightened of ending up severely disabled. And sometimes patients don't actually have it explained to them what their risk of stroke is and how high it is with atrial fibrillation. So this really needs to change. The dialogue between clinicians and patients is one of the most important things that can take place in a management plan. Because the abnormal heart rhythm created by AF leads to fast, small pumping action, the blood is not always pushed through the heart effectively. Blood may occasionally pool in the upper chambers, potentially allowing clots to form. Therein lies the risk. Any clot formed here can later be pumped out into circulation and may block an artery in the brain and cause devastating consequences. Atrial fibrillation is a rhythm disorder and first we must pay attention to the disorder itself. We can either try and convert it to normal sinus rhythm or we can make do with atrial fibrillation but be sure that the heart rate is well controlled and physiological. But beyond that we have to make sure that the patient is managed to reduce the risk of stroke. We have two major forms of anticoagulants. The first are vitamin K antagonists, which have been used for many years in order to try and reduce stroke risk. More recently, we have had the introduction of novel oral anticoagulants, 
which have some advantages compared with vitamin K antagonists. Aspirin was used as an antithrombotic agent to try and reduce stroke risk in association with atrial fibrillation, but it was never shown to be very significant from a clinical point of view. Not everybody with atrial fibrillation will have a stroke, but there are various factors that do indicate a higher risk. For example, the age of the patient, comorbid diseases such as diabetes, heart failure, and high blood pressure, and the presence of a previous stroke. An anticoagulant, of course, makes the blood unlikely to clot. This is very helpful for preventing strokes due to clots, but it can be a big disadvantage when you need the blood to clot. For example, if there's an accident, if there's trauma of some kind. Reassessing patients on a regular basis is essential because the ability of a patient's blood to clot can be affected by many factors, such as diet and other medications, especially if they're taking a vitamin K antagonist, warfarin. A test to check that warfarin is working just enough and not too much is the International Normalized Ratio, or INR. INR works by measuring the time it takes for blood to clot, converting this to a score, and comparing this score against an average. The results of this test can reveal information that could be crucial to both doctor and patient. When looking at patients with atrial fibrillation, frequently they end up on warfarin, which needs to be monitored because it has a very wide range of dosing to achieve an appropriate INR, the blood test that we use to determine warfarin's effectiveness. Ideally, we want an INR between 2 to 3, preferably about 2.5. People where the INR test is very variable may need a reassessment to ensure that they're on the safest therapy for them, particularly with the advent of new anticoagulants, which we know also work to reduce the stroke risk in AF, but are more stable and require less monitoring. There are many challenges with the use of anticoagulants. Clinicians will have to assess the bleeding risk of the patient as people get older, Perhaps they are more at risk of a fall, or it's perceived they're more at risk of a fall. But there's also all the monitoring that has to go with the vitamin K antagonist. So they'll have to go regularly for blood tests. For a lot of patients, they will go in and out of their therapeutic range. So monitoring can be as frequently as, as twice a week. But on other times, it can be once every six weeks. The risk of life-threatening stroke for AF patients is very real and very serious. We have heard from experts about how important it is for the patient and doctor to develop a treatment plan together and to share relevant information as it arises to ensure the plan stays relevant and the AF patient is receiving best care. It is just as vital for doctors to understand the feelings and lifestyle concerns of their AF patients as it is for patients to understand their risk of stroke. The role of primary care physicians is significant. They are responsible for educating patients and collaborating with other professionals to help establish and continue a successful treatment or care management plan. Where management of AF is concerned, there are no shortcuts. Better understanding, appropriate planning and long-term doctor-patient communication can hold the key to a fuller, stroke-free life. <laughs>